we begin a, a new series today, and uh, we'll be in the book the books of First and Second Thessalonians, and I'm really uh, glad that you're with us today and honored to have you with us uh, today. I, I do want to give a shout out for Pastor Josh or to Pastor Joshua for preaching the past two weeks. Uh, he did a great job, and I would just tell you, uh, you know, send him an email, give him props, to, uh, just look at him, give him a thumbs up if you don't want to touch him in these days. Uh, but he did a great, in fact, let's do that right now. Everybody look at Josh, give him a thumbs up. Josh, look around. Oh, he's <laughs> So he did a great job, and I tell you, our youth are in, are in good hands, and it's a, it's a, he's a, he's, we're blessed as a church to have him on staff. And so we begin looking at First and Second Thessalonians. You saw the video, and you're going to see that video each week, as, and the tail end of it will be the specific passage that we're going to be in. And uh, that kind of scratches that teacher itch that I have, repetition. You're going to know the background to the book of Thessalonians. You're going to know the background to the book of Thessalonians. You're going to know the book, uh, the background to the book of uh, Thessalonians because repetition is good. Repetition is good. Repetition is what? Good. That's right. It's good. And so you're going to know the background to the book of Thessalonians and how this letter came about. And then those who join us midstream will have an understanding of the context of the passage. And that's important. You want to understand the context of a biblical passage to make proper application to our lives. Now, we know about Paul's time in Thessalonica from Acts chapter 17. And in about the year 50, Paul, who was always up for a road trip, uh, was on his second missionary journey. It's this incredible 3,000-mile journey that took him around what is called the Aegean Sea. We may not be familiar with that, uh, but if you think about the Mediterranean, it's kind of an offshoot of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, Paul travels throughout that area visiting cities, and one of the cities he visited was Thessalonica. In Acts 17, at Thessalonica, Paul uh, is, tells, or it's revealed that Paul preached in the synagogue, it says, for three Sabbaths. He preached there for three Sabbaths. Going to the synagogue and preaching was Paul's way of doing things. He was steeped in Judaism. He was born a Jew. He had a great understanding of the Jewish faith. And so he would go to the synagogue when he would go to a city and try to reason with those of a similar background. He could try to relate to them in ways that others could not. Now, some scholars believe he was there in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths, just those three weeks, and then things got so hot and things got so heavy that Paul, Silas, and Timothy had to get out of Thessalonica. Others believe he preached in the, in the synagogue for three Sabbaths, and then the Jews were angry with him, and he had to leave, and he preached, continued to preach throughout Thessalonica for another couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. And so there's some debate whether he was there in Thessalonica for three weeks or for three months, whatever the length was, what we do know is that God moved in a great way and Jews came to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and Greeks uh, became followers of Jesus Christ and Acts 17 tells us that prominent women or leading women also became followers of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 and Acts 1, uh, Jesus promises that his gospel would be preached to all the nations. The first Christian church that was established in Europe was in Philippi on on Paul's first missionary journey. The second church in Europe was Thessalonica. And if you look at Thessalonica on the map, you will see there's there's Philippi and then a little further west, Uh, About 150, 200 miles is the city of Thessalonica. And so what you see, if you look at the map, kind of step back, you see Jerusalem and you see the gospel spreading out. It's heading now into Europe. Thessalonica and Philippi are both on the continent of Europe, present day Greece. And so the gospel, the mission, what Jesus said would happen is happening. The good news of Jesus Christ has a beachhead in Europe and it's going to spread now throughout the world just as our Lord and Savior said. But as you know, where the gospel goes, there's always opposition. The Jews became angry because Paul was preaching Jesus as the Messiah. The Romans were angry because people were turning from gods, lowercase gods. We'll talk about that. And they were beginning to declare Jesus as Lord of their life, Jesus as Lord of the world, and not Caesar. And so there were riots in the city, and Paul and Silas, he's called Sylvain. Silvanus, that's the Latin for Silas, uh, and uh, Timothy are 
it's getting hot and heavy in Thessalonica. And so the Christians in Thessalonica say, guys, you got to get out of here. And so they escape. In fact, 17 tells us they escape at night. They would eventually end up in Corinth. And Paul from Corinth, and Corinth is about 300 miles uh, south of Thessalonica. Paul is worried about those he left behind in Thessalonica. And so what he does, he sends Timothy to check on them. And rightfully so. Think about it. Paul left a church that was less than a year old. These are babies in Christ. They're puppies. They don't have Bibles like we have today. They don't have apps. They don't have right now media, right? They don't have live streaming. They have none of that. They're kind of just on their own. Paul and Timothy and Silas had to leave. And they're facing persecution. So it's like everything's stacked against this church in Thessalonica. Yet Timothy comes back and tells Paul, you know what? Things aren't falling apart. In fact, they're doing pretty good. And Paul is just blown away by this. Paul is just, wow. And so what he does, he writes a letter to encourage them in their journey. And he calls them, in fact, one of the things to encourage them, he calls them children of the day in chapter 5, verse 5. Um, and that's kind of a double meaning, children of the day. We'll talk about that when we get there. And um, he wants to talk to them about something very specific because they have a question about the return of Jesus Christ. And so those are the themes of this book. That's the scenario, the background to these two letters. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, pair, and uh, I think you're going to be blessed by it, and it'll be a challenge. Now, as we look at the passage today, we'll be in chapter 1 verse, uh, uh, of 1 Thess- first Thessalonians, and we're going to focus in on five words and phrases just as a kind of an overview, and you can, if you look at your Bibles, we're going to be looking at the word church, we're going to be looking at gospel, we're going to be looking at imitators in verse 6, example or model in verse 7, and sounding forth or sounded forth rang out in verse number 8. And so a word about church. The word for church in verse 1 is the Greek word ekklesia. The word ekklesia means called out ones. This idea of being called out by God is echoed in verse number 4 when God says, when Paul says, God has chosen you. We are called out by God. God. We are chosen by God to follow Jesus Christ. The word ecclesia, therefore, begins to tell us about what the church isn't and what the church is. When Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, I will build my ecclesia. There's that word. Jesus wasn't talking about buildings. The first actual New Testament church building was built in about 200, 230, uh, 250, 230, the year 250, 230, somewhere in that area. And the Thessalonian church wasn't saying, hey, we're a church, therefore we have to have a building, and we have to go into debt, and we have to have a debt retirement campaign, and we need to borrow millions and millions of dollars from the bank. Let's find a church, let's find some land, let's put it near a Roman road, Uh, let's do a fulfill the vision campaign, let's have LED lighting, let's have state-of-the-art light walls. The church isn't a building. The church is people. The church is the called out ones. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are part of the ecclesia. You are part of those who have been called out. The church is something greater and more complicated because it was and is people. It is the people called out by God from the world, chosen by God. And the church, the ecclesia, you and I are called to come together and celebrate Jesus and live differently than the world and make a difference in the world. And the point I'm trying to make just in these early moments is that every follower, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been called out by God. You are part of the ecclesia. You are the called out ones. You are the church. And our life should reflect that. So Paul begins this letter as he does a lot of his letters, not all, but a lot of his letters, addressing the ecclesia of a particular community, the called out ones, in this case, Thessalonica. Now, what Paul does in this chapter is really cool. It's just a simple two-fold understanding of this chapter. First, he says to the Thessalonians, I want to tell you how the gospel 
came to you. Okay, so how does the gospel come to us? And then secondly, Paul instructs us now in the year 2020 how the gospel goes from us. How does the gospel come to us? How does the gospel go out from us? And it's an amazing and encouraging letter. So how did the gospel come to them? And how does the gospel come to you and me? Well, let's begin with the word gospel. The word gospel means good news. The gospel is a message of good news. Now, notice what Paul says in verse number five. He makes a really important distinction. He says, our gospel. When we say the word gospel today, it has a very religious um, ambiance to it. We think Jesus. We think Bible when we talk about the word gospel. But in this time, in the first century, the word gospel was a common word used for political reasons. It was good news. And how it would manifest itself was by the Romans. They would use it publicly to announce a great event or a great achievement. They would send heralds out. Something wonderful would happen that they would want the Roman Empire to know about. They would send these heralds out throughout these Roman roads, throughout the Roman world, and they would proclaim the gospel. They would proclaim the good news. Here's the gospel. Our armies have defeated the Parthians. That's the good news. Here's the gospel. Caesar is now Lord of all. Caesar is now in charge. That's the good news. And so it, had a, it was more of a, 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 a political uh, um, usage than it is religious usage. And so Paul says, that little four, three-letter word, O-U-R, our gospel, Paul's gospel, his good news is different. His gospel, his good news, is that Jesus defeated death and Jesus is Lord of all. And so Paul's gospel message, his good news, his good news message is different from other gospels. And one of the differences of Paul's gospel, of our gospel, Paul says that his gospel wasn't just in words. It wasn't just, hey, Here's the latest news from the Roman Empire. Here's the latest big event you need to know about. It came with power, with power from the Holy Spirit. Now, that has many implications, but one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. And that's what happened. Notice in verse 5, there was full conviction. One of the verses, uh, uh, one of the, um, um, I think it's the NIV version of the Bible says, came with deep conviction. So the Holy Spirit shared the gospel. The Holy Spirit came and it's like the Holy Spirit is speaking to the lives of the Thessalonians and like digging deep, going to those dark places that we don't like to talk about, that we keep to ourselves, that is just our little secret. And the Holy Spirit with Deep conviction goes into those closets and shines the light. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, those things that offend God. And that's a good and wonderful, wonderful thing, but even more wonderful, more amazing. The Holy Spirit then empowers us to turn away from that sin and turn to God. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and convict us of sin and say, okay, now you're going to pay and die for that sin. No, the Holy Spirit comes to us, convicts us of that sin, and invites us to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ it's such a beautiful moment that happened he convicts and then he empowers us to move away from that sin to Jesus Christ and the proof is found in the life of the Thessalonians notice verse number nine they turned from dead and meaningless idols to the living God they turned away from sin and turned to God and that was no small moment okay we kind of oh that's good that's cool That was a big deal in Thessalonica. The people of Thessalonica lived about 50 miles from Mount Olympus. It's about 50 miles to the south, southwest of of Thessalonica. That is the, the locker room of Greek and Roman gods, right? That's home base for Zeus and Aphrodite and Diana. And yet in the shadow of Mount Olympus, the Thessalonians the ecclesia, those who were being called out, come to God, convicted of sin, they turn away from the sin, they come to God. They went against culture. I mean, you think about it, they are steeped in idol worship. They are, that's how they grew up. That's what they knew. Many of their jobs had gods for their specific um, 
occupation, your specific job, and you worship that God. And if you didn't worship that God, you could lose your job. Following Christ meant being cut off from family and friends from Jesus. Turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus is Lord, meant Caesar was no longer your Lord. And that was punishable by death. And so turning away from these idols and turning away to God meant you could possibly lose your job. It meant that you could uh, be cut off from your family. It meant that you were going against culture and it risked death because you were acknowledging Caesar, or no longer acknowledging Caesar as Lord. And you see the implications of their commitment. All those things wrapped up in the words, much affliction. One uh, version says severe suffering. Their commitment was really, really a high stakes commitment. How could they do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that says, you know what, I may lose my job, I'm going to follow Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that says, you know what, I know what culture says, I'm going to follow Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that says, you know what, I may lose friends and family, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to worship Jesus and no one else, no other thing as well. And that's why Paul says, our gospel came to you in power. Our good news is different than any other good news. Paul's gospel wasn't just in words. It's an invitation to reorientation, the reorientation of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And possibly, hear me on this, what Paul is saying may give us some understanding as to why some people who claim to be Christians do not look like Christians. There's no life change. Because sometimes the gospel comes without power. The gospel comes, and people interpret it as a box to check. They have their career in order, their family, they have a house. They're all lined up. Okay, now I need to get my religion in order. Check, 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 check. The gospel comes with a box. The gospel comes with silliness and fun. And I'm not against silliness and fun. My wife will tell you at home, I'm so goofy. I love having fun. I love being silly. One of my favorite, um, I, I, I watch a guy on YouTube. Um, it's, uh, it's called Wretched. And if you ever get a chance, watch Wretched. It's fun. It's intense, though. It's hard-hitting. I love Todd. That's the guy's name. And he shared, I, a couple of weeks ago I was listening, and he shared about in this one particular ministry, it's a youth ministry, and how in the ministry there, you know, the challenge of Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And the youth pastor was putting peanut butter under his arm and challenging the children, the youth, to lick the peanut butter from under his arm. There was mud wrestling going on. Right? The gospel comes with licking peanut butter. The gospel comes with mud wrestling. Now again, those things are fine. It's attention and it's, you know, okay, the kids are being goofy. I get all that. And I'm, listen, again, I'm a proponent of neither one of those, but a lot of fun things, okay? But that's how the gospel comes. Oh, the gospel's gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun. And when you follow Jesus, you learn very soon to go counterculture is dangerous business. Some receive the gospel with this idea of prosperity. Oh, if I follow Jesus, I'll be rich. And if you've been following Jesus, you know that we are very blessed people, but we have financial problems just like everybody else. The gospel sounds good and cool and woke. To some, it sounds logical. But who doesn't want life insurance, fire insurance? Who doesn't want to go to heaven? And that's why I think we, we face a challenge. And we baptize three uh, little ones today, young ones today. And I was so impressed that Crystal had them write these essays to share their journey of faith. Because I think a lot of children like the gospel. A lot of people like the gospel. They like Jesus. They like the idea of being in heaven with mom and dad and pa and grandma. They love those words. They like the idea of helping people. 
But the power is not there. It's not reorienting their life. And it's a hard thing to, to get our arms around sometimes. Just recently, Chloe and I reconnected with a former student of our student ministry. She was at, involved in our student ministry probably six years ago. Wonderful young lady. I knew her and just a d- dynamic young lady. She loved going on the mission trip. She liked things about church. She liked coming to church. She liked being part of something. She even read her Bible and was baptized. But as we talk, she's now going into the mission field. And as we talk, she said, but I realize now, looking back, there was never a life change. There was never a serious understanding of what God was trying to do in my life. And she went off to uh, 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 the University of Texas at Austin, and she got saved in there, at that place, of all places, right? University of Texas at Austin, she got saved. So she had heard the good news of Jesus. She heard the gospel, but not with that power, that life that changes our life. Receiving the gospel isn't just agreeing with the words and thinking Jesus is loving and liking Christian music and having fun and checking off a box. The power that comes is so much greater and it's so much more profound Uh, profound than what we understand it means Jesus when the gospel comes to you in the power of the Holy Spirit it means Jesus becomes the Lord of your life he is first and foremost you turn out you go against culture you're willing to risk that job you're willing to risk your life this young lady heard the words of the gospel but there's no power and when the gospel comes with power there is life change and exhibit a are our friends in Thessalonica so What I'm saying, if there is no life change, if there's no repentance, okay, no reordering of priorities, then maybe, 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 maybe the gospel simply came to you in words. People who profess Jesus and then walk away. They heard the gospel, they liked it, maybe believed it, but it didn't come with power. In fact, they were never children of the day. A dear friend of mine, about two years ago, I think it was, we did church together, we did life together, we did small group together. He renounced his faith in Jesus Christ, made a public declaration on one of the social media elements. I think he liked the gospel. He liked what it offered. Yeah. I'll take heaven. That's cool. But there's no heart change. No reorientation. We see today um, in the Christian music industry, if you've been keeping up with it, a lot of Christian artists, and there have been even pastors who have renounced their faith in Jesus Christ. They turn away from God and turn to idols. It's the reverse of what the Thessalonians went through. And I would argue maybe they did not receive the gospel with the Holy Spirit power because it's the Holy Spirit that changes us. It's the Holy Spirit that reorients our life. And they come, the Thessalonians do, with much affliction and with joy. The ecclesia was changed by the gospel and with the power. So how does the gospel come to us? By God with power. But that's not the end of the story. Paul encourages them. And so how does he encourage them? This is how the gospel goes from us. So it comes to us by God with power. By the, by, sent by God, we're chosen by God, we're elected by God. And then it comes, goes out from us as Um, And then we talk about, then Paul talks about how it goes out from us. Okay, so in verse number six, notice what it says. The Thessalonians became imitators of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. They became imitators of the Lord. Let that sink in for a moment. You know where I'm going with this. 
Paul begins by saying, we lived well among you for your sake. Paul, Silas, and Timothy set a Christ-like example. Paul showed them what following Jesus looks like. Now, it has been said that imitation is the greatest form of what? Flattery, that's right. And in this time, imitation of a great teacher or rabbi was not only common, it was expected. Students of a rabbi or a teacher would imitate their teacher, how they walked, how they talked, how he ate, how he lived. When Jesus said to his disciples, come, follow me, it was an invitation. Come, live with me. Do life like I do life. Do what I do. Say what I say. Think like I think. Experience God like I experience God. In fact, To not imitate a rabbi or a teacher was interpreted to mean that your teacher's way of teaching, that teacher's way of life was not worth following. I mean, if you're not going to follow, if you're not going to live like that person, what's the point of following them? What's the point of saying, yeah, I follow that teacher. I follow their teachings. Now, the word imitator in verse 6, the Greek is pronounced mimetes, mimetes. And that is where we get the word mimic so Paul reminds the Thessalonians you became mimetes mimics of us and Jesus in other words the Thessalonians were third generation mimics of Jesus you had Jesus then you had the disciples who did what Jesus did Paul would be experienced Christ face to face and then so first generation second generation and now the Thessalonians are third generation mimics they are third generation imitators of Jesus Christ and the question that you know is coming let me ask it now do you imitate Jesus Christ do you mimic Jesus now, I warned my wife about this. Uh, I have embarrassed my wife many times. And uh, today, we go one step further. We go past humilia- uh, embarrassing to humiliation. And so I'm going to humiliate my wife today. I'm going to humiliate me. Um, and I'm going to imitate some people. Okay? And I want you to score me. On a scale of 0 to 10, I want you to score my imitation. Now, I've Christianized these imitations, okay? Now, my first imitation is going to be of a guy by the name of Jimmy Cagney, James Cagney, okay? He was a movie star in the 30s and 40s and 50s, okay? He did gangster movies, okay? So this is Jimmy Cagney. Mm, mm, You dirty rat. Mm, You killed my brother. Mm. And now, mm, I'm going to forgive you. Mm. Jimmy Cagney. How would you score that? Don't tell me. No, no, no. (laughs) Pity is not appreciated on this. (laughs) How about this? Let me do another imitation. Okay. And show my fellow Thessalonians, ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for the church. John F. Kennedy. How about this one? Got to work up to this one. It's hard. I've always practiced this. Never done it publicly. (laughs) For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's Billy Graham. Now, (laughs) oh, (laughs) It sounded like Yoda. It's a, okay. So, how are my imitations? And I know they were bad. And I know it's not about voice inflection and tone and volume. I get that. You know what I'm saying. It's about heart and something deeper. Does your life look like Jesus? Do your words sound like Jesus? Do you seek holiness like Jesus? Do you pray like Jesus? Do you love like Jesus? Do you sacrifice like Jesus? Do you forgive like Jesus? Do you imitate Jesus? See, the Thessalonians did. Paul calls them imitators. You scored me on my imitations. I ask you to. And if you're honest, I think it would be zero, zero, and zero. How would the Holy Spirit score you on your imitation of Jesus.
Now, there are some who may say, I can't be like Jesus. I don't know how to be like Jesus. Let me say in love to you this morning, you cannot imitate or mimic someone you don't know. How can you mimic Jesus if you've never met Jesus? How can you mimic Jesus if you've never read his words? How can you love like Jesus if you've never seen how Jesus loves? You have to study them and talk with them and get to know them. Are you modeling faith in your life? Does your life look like Jesus? And here's the takeaway, the follower of Jesus, because of the power in us, should seek to imitate Jesus in thought and action. This week, if you have remind, we're going to be reminding you every day to imitate Jesus. In your meetings, imitate Jesus. In your workplace, imitate Jesus. In your marriage, imitate Jesus. Talking with your kiddos, imitate Jesus. Talking to your parents, imitate Jesus. And again, it's, it's a heart thing. Let me be very clear. I understand that. But I think you know what I'm saying. And so the Thessalonians mimic the missionaries and Jesus. And then Paul gives them props. He says, you set an example. You modeled Jesus to others. The Greek word for example in verse number seven is the word tupos. It means to strike or leave an imprint. It's the same word used by Romans to describe what they would do with a coin if they wanted to make an imprint on the coin. Okay? Put a picture on the coin. Put an image of, a, of an eagle on the coin. That's what he's talking about there. And what Paul is saying, it's like being hit by a pitch in softball or baseball. You get the seams on your leg or you get the seams, right? It's that imprint is there. And what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians is because of the way you're living, you are making an impression. You're leaving an imprint on others, And so the gospel comes to the ecclesia in Thessalonica with power. They mimic Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Jesus. And in their mimicking, they were modeling what active faith in Jesus looks like. Their modeling Jesus was so great that it becomes famous throughout the region. Paul went around and people would say, man, we heard about the Thessalonians. Paul didn't bring them up. People are bringing them up to Paul. Now, I asked you earlier, do you imitate Jesus in your life? And let me come at it from another way. Let's put you in the sandals of Paul. You're a follower of Jesus. What if every follower, okay, the followers of Thessalonica are imitating Paul. What if every follower mimicked, followed your example of what it means to follow Jesus Christ? What if every follower mimicked you? What if every follower modeled you? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your prayer life? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your giving? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your obedience? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your viewing habits? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your humility, grace, and mercy? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your handling of suffering and disappointment? What if every follower of Jesus modeled your view of other races? What if every person who followed you and you modeled for them, what if they modeled the way you share your faith? So clearing the way of the clutter, do you model Jesus? You know, we live in a very individualistic uh, culture. You know, do your own thing. You be you. And uh, yesterday I, I did a, 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 I officiated a, a, a sermon, uh, so I officiated a um, funeral. Uh, and in case you don't know, in case you're not getting the newsletter, it's hard to stay in contact with each other these days because of the church. One of, one of the beloved people of our church passed away, Mr. Jack, uh, and uh, he passed away a week ago Saturday, and uh, I got, I had the privilege of seeing him one last time, and I uh, got to talk with him in person, and shook hands, it was a beautiful thing, and spoke on your behalf as the church. His service was yesterday in Mart, Texas, near Waco, and so I drove up to Mart and did the service. It's about a three-hour drive, and so I got there pretty early. Didn't want to be crunched for time. And I love walking around cemeteries. How many like walking around cemeteries? They just, I don't know if that's morbid or I don't know. Uh, if you're weird, I'm, I don't know. But it's just, there's a, it's very, um, I don't know, cathartic. And I was looking at the tombstones and names and years. And on this one stone, the epitaph read, 
I did it my way. And I guess they're taking it from the song, Elvis Presley or Sinatra, whoever sang it. And many times that's how we approach life. I did it. I'm going to do it my way. The Thessalonians did it the way of Jesus. They modeled Jesus. They mimicked Jesus. They were like Jesus. Now, the idea of modeling is so important. Again, it's contrary to believe that uh, you should keep your faith to yourself. That's what we have been brainwashed. Don't bring your faith to the workplace. Don't bring your faith to, you know, fill in the blank. And I would tell you this morning, that is absolute nonsense. If you are modeling Jesus, you cannot help but to have an impact on others. Are you modeling Jesus? Are you impacting others? I hope you are. I hope you are. For the Thessalonians, they were so like Jesus that the gospel sounded forth, and the Greek word there is echoed. It just echoed. It just echoed forth. Their faith echoed. And so you have these babies in Christ facing severe suffering and making, yet in that environment, they are making an impact. And so how does the gospel come to us? It comes to us in power by the Holy Spirit. How does it go from us? It goes from us when we model Christ, when we live for Christ, when we become a true follower of Jesus Christ. Are you letting your faith ring out at home with friends on Facebook, at work? Are you willing to let your faith ring out? Because you see, we sometimes say, well, I don't want to lose my job. That's exactly what the Thessalonians were facing. I don't want to be ridiculed by culture. That's exactly what the uh, Thessalonians were facing. I don't want to give up these gods. It could really hurt me. That's exactly what the, the ecclesia in Thessalonica was facing. And they turned to God. It goes out from us by modeling and being an example and letting our lives sound forth. In verse 10, very quickly today, because we're going to talk about it a lot more in these passages, Paul mentions in verse 10, the return of Jesus and the coming wrath of God. Now, these letters are written about 50 to 52 AD. We're not exactly sure. That's 20 years after the burial, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This makes the Thessalonian letters possibly the earliest letters in the New Testament. Maybe Galatians was written before them, but it, these are probably the earliest letters written. And this tells us something about the early church and what they thought about. They wondered, they pondered about the return of Jesus. The idea of the Lord's return was paramount to the thoughts of the early church. And in fact, as we look at these books, in each chapter, every single chapter in 1 Thessalonians talks about the return of Jesus. Every chapter in 2 Thessalonians, except the last one, talks about the, uh, the, the, the situation at the return of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians deal primarily with the return of Jesus. 2 Thessalonians deal with the Antichrist and judgment. In fact, if you took all the passages of 1 and 2 Thessalonians and just cut them up, and you would, one in four would deal in some form or fashion with the return of Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? The early church lived expecting to see Jesus return in their lifetime. It was a major doctrine. It was an important doctrine. And we can look back at the Thessalonians and say, well, boy, they were wrong. Boy, did they miss it. What a waste of time. No man knows the day or the hour. What a waste of energy. But perhaps a better way to look at it is to say the early church was a model on how we are to live our lives. They modeled Jesus impacting others. At the same time, they looked for the return of Jesus Christ. Paul never says to them, guys, you just let it go. Stop thinking about it. Nor did Paul say, focus all your attention on the return of Jesus. He invites us to live, I always get it backwards, vertical. Is this vertical? That's horizontal? Okay, horizontal. Okay, Paul invites us to live horizontal and vertical. That's what, love God. Love God. Seek him, chase him. Seek Jesus, chase Jesus. Live, let the Holy Spirit come in your life. Be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Love others, love your neighbor. 
And we can fall into a trap just focusing all our attentions on Jesus and his return, and we become consumed by that. And Paul never says to go there. He says to model Christ, you're doing great. But then he talks about it. It's both. We can live for Jesus and look for the return of Jesus. Years ago when I was saved, uh, I was a, a young Christian, and I just knew Jesus was going to return at any moment. I knew. And uh, in fact, the year was 1988, and there was a book that came out, a little booklet. I can still see it, white and red letters. 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. <laughs> Done, he's coming. In 1989, another book came out. 89 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1989. <laughs> okay, it's 89. Okay. I was so determined. I just knew Jesus was going to return. And I was going to quit school. I was going to just, hey, I was just going to wait. I'm going to tell people about Jesus, and I don't have to worry about going to school. I'm not going to worry about a job. Uh, he's coming. And an evangelist came to our church, a guy by the name of Cecil Todd. I can still, I just so appreciate him. I went to him. He talked about the return of Jesus. And I was like, oh, yeah, he's coming back. I just want to quit school and, and go tell people about Jesus. What do you think? He was so kind and so sweet. He could have really abused me. Son, you stay in school and tell people about Jesus. And what he's saying is basically what Paul was telling the Thessalonians. Guys, you're... Listen, Jesus is coming. That's great. You keep modeling him. You keep modeling Jesus and have an impact. And we'll talk about the return of Jesus more and more. Churches love to talk about marriage and all these other things, and they're good, and they're right things. One of the major doctrines of the early church was the return of Jesus Christ. And he is going to return. Acts 1, Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. And the disciples were watching him go. And the angel appeared to those disciples and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus, my friends, is going to return the same way. He went up. From the Mount of Olives, he's coming down and he will step on the Mount of Olives. It will be a visible appearance of the Lord. And he will come for his ecclesia. He will come for those who have been called out, who have turned to God, who have said no to idols, who have said no to the world. The ecclesia will be rescued from God's wrath. And that means those who are not part of the ecclesia, those who are not part of the called out ones, will face God's wrath. And I would ask you this morning, are you part of the ecclesia? Have you been called out? Or will you re experience God's wrath? God is going to send his son. Do you know Jesus? The gospel is this. Jesus died for your sins. The good news is this. Our gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He took your punishment you deserve so that you can be in relationship with God the Father. And Paul would write the Romans and say this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, in this room, we come to you just for those who are part of the ecclesia, who heard the gospel and the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit convicted us deeply. And 
We turn to you, God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you that we will not face your wrath. God, I pray for those who are part of the ecclesia in this room that you've chosen, that you've called out. I pray, Father God, that we would model Jesus to the world. That we would impact the world. That we would live and leave an imprint. Father, for those in this room that are not part of the ecclesia, who like the gospel, it's cool. It's fire insurance. It's fun. I pray that you would open their eyes to the power, the life-changing power, the reorientation that they would put away idols that they would turn from culture and they would recognize Jesus as Lord and if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now you've heard the gospel the power of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you inviting you to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Let this be the day. Let this be the moment. Become part of the ecclesia. Ask Jesus right now to forgive you of your sins. Repent. Make him Lord of your life. Father, thank you that the gospel has come to us in power. Father, thank you that we're invited to make an impact in this world. It's the least that we can do. Jesus, you are worthy to be followed. Jesus, you are worthy to be mimicked to be imitated. Help us to do that in our life. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Would you stand at this time? Uh, We're going to have a closing prayer and I do want to encourage you, listen, listen, um, if something struck a nerve, uh, please um, email me. I would love to speak with you. Uh, we'll do the social distancing thing. I'll wear a mask or two or seven, however many you want me to wear. We'll stand 20 feet apart. We'll shout it to each other. Uh, we can do it by Zoom or email or Skype or whatever you want to do, whatever platform you want to use. Hey, let's get together and talk about Jesus. Uh, you got to get this one right. You got to get this one right, gang. You got to have that relationship with Jesus Christ or you will face the wrath of God. Um, you know, you can be wrong on a lot of things. You can be wrong on a lot of things. You can't be wrong on that one. And if you're not right with God, let, don't, don't run from this. Let's do business. Let's do business. Let's pray. Father, go with us now as we head our separate ways. Uh, thank you for loving us. Thank you for just allowing us to be part of your ecclesia, that the gospel is now, Lord, uh, just so there and we can use it to tell others and the power of God will go uh, with that gospel God help us to use it go with us let us be a light for you bless us Father God as we go um, and let us live a life let us model our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and it's in his name we pray amen and amen God bless you have a great Sunday